Section 11 of Anton Chekhov and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anton Chekhov and Other Essays by Lev Shestov. Translated by John Middleton Murray and Samuel Kotelyansky. Section 11. The Theory of Knowledge, Part 1 the theory of knowledge as apologetics etc the modern theory of knowledge though it always consciously takes its rise from kant has in one respect quite disregarded the master's commandment it is very strange that the theorists of knowledge who usually cannot agree among themselves upon anything have as it were agreed to understand the problem of knowledge quite otherwise than kant kant undertook to investigate our cognitive faculties in order to establish foundations in virtue of which certain existing sciences could be accepted and others rejected one may say that the second purpose was chief hume's scepticism made him uneasy only in theory he knew beforehand that whatever theory of knowledge he might invent mathematics and the natural sciences would remain sciences and metaphysics be rejected in other words his aim was not to justify science but to explain the possibility of its existence and he started from the point of view that no one can seriously doubt the truths of mathematics and natural science but now the position is different the theorists of knowledge direct all their efforts towards justifying scientific knowledge why does scientific knowledge really need justification of course there are cranks sometimes even cranks of genius like our own tolstoy who attack science but their attacks offend no one nor do they cause alarm scientists continue their researches as before the universities flourish discovery follows discovery and the theorists of knowledge themselves do not spend sleepless nights in the endeavor to find new justifications for science yet i repeat though they can come to an understanding about practically nothing else they amaze us by their unanimity upon this point they are all convinced that it is their duty to justify science and exalt her so that the modern theory of knowledge is no longer a science but an apology and its demonstrations are like those of apology once science must be defended it is necessary to begin by praising her that is by selecting evidence and data to show that science fulfills some mission or other but indubitably a very high and important one or on the other hand by painting a picture of the fate that would overtake the world if it was deprived of science thus the apologetic element has begun to play almost as large a part in the theory of knowledge as it has done hitherto in theology perhaps the time is at hand when scientific apologists will be officially recognized as a philosophic discipline but que se excuses se accuse it is plain that all is not well with science since she began to justify herself besides apologetics are only apologetics and sooner or later the theory of knowledge will be tired of psalms of praise and will demand a more complex and responsible task and a real labor at present the theorists start with the assumption that scientific knowledge is perfect knowledge and therefore the premises upon which it is builded are not subject to criticism the law of causation is not justified because it appears to be the expression of a real relation of things nor even because we have the data at our disposal which could convince us that it does not and will never admit exceptions that uncaused effects are impossible all these things are lacking but we are told they are not needed the chief thing is that the causal law makes science possible while to reject it means to reject science and knowledge generally all anticipation and even as some few hold reason itself 
clearly if one has to choose between a slightly dubious admission on the one side and the prospect of chaos and insanity on the other there will be no long hesitation apologetics we see has chosen the most powerful of arguments ad hominem but all such arguments partake of one common defect they are not constant and they are double-edged today they defend scientific knowledge tomorrow they will attack it indeed it so happens that the very belief in the causal law begets a great disquiet and turmoil in the soul which finally produces all the horrors of chaos and madness the certainty that the existing order is immutable is for certain minds synonymous with the certainty that life is nonsensical and absurd probably the disciples of christ had that feeling when the last words of their crucified master reached them from the cross my god my god why hast thou forsaken me and the modern theorists may explain triumphantly that when the law became the instrument of chaos and madness it was ipso facto abolished christ has risen says the disciples of christ i have said that the theorists may triumph but i must confess that i have not found in any of them an open glorification of such an obvious proof of the truth of their teaching of the resurrection of christ they say not a word on the contrary they make every effort to avoid it and pass it by in silence and this circumstance compels us to pause and think a dilemma arises if you grant that the law of causation suffers no exception then your soul will be eternally haunted by the last words of the crucified christ if you do not then you will have no science some assert that it is impossible to live without science without knowledge and that such a life is horror and madness others cannot be reconciled to the thought that the most perfect of men died the death of a murderer what should we do without which thing is it impossible for man to live without scientific knowledge or without the conviction that truth and spiritual perfection are in the last resort the victors of this world and how will the theory of knowledge stand with regard to questions such as these will it still continue its exercise in apologetics or will it at last understand that this is not its real problem and that if it would preserve the right to be called philosophy it will have not to justify and exalt the existing science but to examine and direct some science of its own it means above all to put the question is scientific knowledge really perfect or is it perhaps imperfect and should it therefore yield its present honourable place to another science evidently this is the most important question for the theory of knowledge yet this question it never puts it wants to exalt existing science it has been is now and probably will long continue to be apologetics truth and utility mill seeking to prove that all our sciences even the mathematical have an empiric origin brings forward the following consideration if on every occasion that we had to take twice two things some deity slipped one extra thing into our hands we should be convinced that twice two is not four but five and perhaps mill is right perhaps he should not divine what was the matter we are much more concerned to discover what is practically necessary and directly useful to us than to search for truth if a deity with each four things slipped a fifth into our hands we should accept the additional thing and consider it natural intelligible necessary impossible to be otherwise the very uniformity in the sequence of phenomena observed by the empirical philosophers was also slipped into our hands by whom when who dares to ask once the law is established no one is interested in anything any more now we can foretell the future now we can use the things slipped into our hands and the rest cometh of the evil one philosophers and teachers 
everyone knows that schopenhauer was for many years not only not recognized but not even read his books were used for waste paper it was only towards the end of his life that he had readers and admirers and of course critics for every admirer is at bottom a most merciless and importunate critic he must understand everything make everything agree and of course the master must supply the necessary explanations schopenhauer who did not have the experience of being a master till his old age at first behaved very benevolently to his disciples questions and patiently gave the explanations required but the further one goes into the forest the thicker are the trees the most loyal perplexities of his pupils became more and more importunate until at last the old man lost patience i didn't undertake to explain all the secrets of the universe to everyone who wanted to know them he once exclaimed when a certain pupil persisted in emphasizing the contradictions he had noticed in schopenhauer and really is a master obliged to explain everything in schopenhauer's words we are given an answer not ambiguous a philosopher not only cannot be a teacher he does not want to be one there are teachers in schools in universities they teach arithmetic grammar logic metaphysics the philosopher has quite a different task one which does not in the least resemble teaching truth as a social substance there are many ways real and imaginary of objectively verifying philosophic opinions but they all reduce we know to trial by the law of contradiction true everyone is aware that no single philosophic doctrine is able to support such a trial so that pending a better future people consider it possible to display a certain tenderness in the examination they are usually satisfied if they come to the conclusion that the philosopher made a genuine attempt to avoid contradictions for instance they forgive spinoza his inconsistency because of his a more intellectualist day kant for his love of morality and his praise of disinterestedness plato for the originality and purity of his idealistic impulses and aristotle for the vastness and universality of his knowledge so that strictly speaking we must confess that we have no real objective method of verifying a philosophical truth and when we criticize other people's systems we judge arbitrarily after all if a philosopher suits us for some reason we do not trouble him with the law of contradiction if he does not we summon him before the court to be judged with the utmost rigor of the law confident beforehand that he will be found guilty on every count but sometimes there arises the desire to verify one's own philosophic convictions to play the farce of objective verification with them to look for contradictions in oneself i do not suppose that even germans are capable of that and yet one desires to know whether he does indeed possess the truth or whether he has only a universal air in his hands what is to be done i think there is a way he should think to himself that it is absolutely impossible for his truth to be binding upon anybody if in spite of this he still refuses to renounce her if the truth can suffer such an ordeal and yet remain the same to him as she was before then it may be supposed that she is worth something for often we appreciate conviction not because it has an intrinsic value but because it commands a high price on the market robinson crusoe probably had a totally different way of thinking to that of a modern writer or professor whose books are exposed to the appreciation of his numerous confreres who can create for him the renown of a wise man and a scholar or utterly ruin his reputation even with the greeks whom we are accustomed to regard as model thinkers opinions had to use the language of economics not so much a demand as an exchange value the greeks had no knowledge of the printing press and no literary reviews 
they usually took their wisdom out into the marketplace and applied all their efforts to persuade people to acknowledge its value and it is hard to maintain that wisdom which is constantly being offered to people should not adapt itself to people's tastes it is true to say that wisdom became accustomed to value itself to the exact degree to which it could count on people's appreciation in other words it appears that the value of wisdom like that of all other commodities not only with us but with the greeks before us is a social affair the most modern philosophy has given up concealing the fact the teleology of the rationalists who follow fichte as well as the pragmatists who consider themselves the successors of mill is openly based upon the social point of view and speaks of collective creations truth which is not good for all and always in the home market of the foreign is not truth perhaps its value is even defined by the quality of labor spent upon it marx might triumph under different flags his theory has found admission into every sphere of contemporary thought there would hardly be found one philosopher who would apply the method of verifying truth which i have proposed and hardly a single modern idea which would stand the test doctrines and deductions if you want to ruin a new idea try to give it the widest possible publicity men will begin to reflect upon it to try it by their daily needs to interpret it to make deductions from it in a word to squeeze it into their own prepared logical apparatus or more likely they will cover it up with the debris of their own habitual and intelligible ideas and it will become as dead as everything that is begotten by logic perhaps this explains the tendency of philosophers to so clothe their thoughts that their form may hinder the approach of the general public to them the majority of philosophic systems are chaotically and obscurely expounded so that not every educated person can understand them it is a pity to kill one's own child and every one does his best to save it from premature death the most dangerous enemies of an idea are deductions from it as though they followed of themselves the idea does not presuppose them they are usually pressed upon it indeed people very often say the idea is quite right but it leads to conclusions which are not at all acceptable again how often has a philosopher to attend the sad spectacle of his pupils deserting all his ideas and feeding only upon the conclusions from them every thinker who has had the misfortune to attract attention while he was yet alive knows by bitter experience what deductions are and yet you will rarely find a philosopher to offer open and courageous resistance to his continuators and still more rarely a philosopher to say outright that his work needs no continuation that it will not bear continuation that it exists only in and for itself that it is self-sufficient if someone said this how would he be answered people could not dispute with him try to dispute with a man who wants neither to dispute nor to demonstrate the only answer is an appeal to the popular verdict to lynch law people are so weak and naive that they will at all costs see a teacher in the usual sense of the word in every philosopher in other words they really want to throw upon him the responsibility for their actions their present their future and their whole fate socrates was not executed for teaching but because the athenians thought he was dangerous to athens and in all ages men have approached truth with this criterion as though they knew beforehand that truth must be of use and able to protect them one of the greatest teachings christianity was also persecuted because it seemed dangerous to the self-appointed guardians or if you will because it was really very dangerous to roman ideals of course neither socrates's death nor the deaths of thousands of the early christians saved the ancient culture and polity from decay but no one has learned anything from the lesson 
people think that these were all accidental mistakes against which no one was secure in ancient times but which will never again recur and therefore they continue to make deductions as they used from every truth and to judge the truth by the deductions they have made and they have their reward although there have been on earth many wise men who knew much that is infinitely more valuable than all the treasures for which men are ready even to sacrifice their lives still wisdom is to us a book with seven seals a hidden hoard upon which we cannot lay our hands many the vast majority are even seriously convinced that philosophy is a most tedious and painful occupation to which are doomed some miserable wretches who enjoy the odious privilege of being called philosophers i believe that even professors of philosophy the more clever of them not seldom share this opinion and suppose that therein lies the ultimate secret of their science revealed to the initiate alone fortunately the position is otherwise it may be that mankind is destined never to change in this respect and a thousand years hence men will care much more about deductions theoretical and practical from the truth than about truth itself but real philosophers men who know what they want and at what they aim will hardly be embarrassed by this they will utter their truths as before without in the least considering what conclusions will be drawn from them by the lovers of logic end of section eleven section twelve of anton chekhov and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Anton Chekhov and Other Essays by Lev Shestov, translated by John Middleton Murray and Samuel Kotalyansky. Section 12. The Theory of Knowledge, Part 2. Truths Proven and Unproven, etc. Whence did we get the habit of requiring proofs of each idea that is expressed? if we put aside the consideration as having no real meaning in the present case that men do often purposely deceive their neighbors for gain or other interests then strictly speaking the necessity for proof is entirely removed it is true that we can still deceive ourselves and fall into involuntary error sometimes we take a vision for a reality and we wish to guard against that offensive mistake but as soon as the possibility of bona fide error is removed then we may relate simply without arguments judgments or references if you please believe if you don't don't and there is one province the very province which has always attracted to itself the most remarkable representatives of the human race where proofs in the general acceptation are even quite impossible we have hitherto taught that that which cannot be proved should not be spoken about still worse we have so arranged our language that strictly speaking everything we say is expressed in the form of a judgment that is in a form which presupposes not merely the possibility but the necessity of proofs perhaps this is the reason why metaphysics has been the object of incessant attack metaphysics evidently was not only unable to find a form of expression for her truths which would free her from the obligation of proof she did not even want to she considered herself the science par excellence and therefore supposed that she had more largely and more strictly to prove the judgments which she took under her wing she thought that if she were to neglect the duty of demonstration she would lose all her rights and that i imagine was her fatal mistake the correspondence of rights and duties is perhaps a cardinal truth or a cardinal fiction of the doctrine of law but it has been introduced into the sphere of philosophy by a misunderstanding here rather the contrary principle is enthroned rights are in inverse proportion to duties 
and only there where all duties have ceased is the greatest and most sovereign right acquired the right of communion with ultimate truths here we must not for one moment forget that ultimate truths have nothing in common with middle truths the logical construction of which we have so diligently studied for the last two thousand years the fundamental difference is that the ultimate truths are absolutely unintelligible unintelligible i repeat but not inaccessible it is true that middle truths also are strictly speaking unintelligible who will assert that he understands light heat pain pride joy degradation nevertheless our mind in alliance with omnipotent habit has with the assistance of some strained interpretation given to the combination of phenomena in the segment of universal life that is accessible to us a certain kind of harmony and unity and this from time immemorial has gained repute under the name of an intelligible explanation of the created world but the known which is the familiar world is sufficiently unintelligible to make good faith require of us that we should accept unintelligibility as the fundamental predicate of being it is impossible to hold as some do that the only reason why we do not understand the world is that something is hidden from us or that our mind is weak so that if the supreme being wished to unveil the secret of creation to us or if the human brain should so much develop in the next ten million years that he will excel us as far as we excel our official ancestor the ape then the world will be intelligible no 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 by their very essence the operations which we perform upon reality to understand it are useful and necessary only so long as they do not pass a certain limit it is impossible to understand the arrangement of a locomotive it is also legitimate to seek an explanation of an eclipse of the sun or of an earthquake but a moment comes only we cannot define it exactly when explanations lose all meaning and are good for nothing any more it is as though we were led by a rope the law of sufficient reason to a certain place and left there now go wherever you like and since we have grown so used to the rope in our lives we begin to believe that it is part of the very essence of the world one of the most remarkable thinkers spinoza thought that god himself was bound by necessity let any one probe himself carefully and he will find that he is not merely unable to think but almost unable to live without the hypothesis of spinoza the work of hume who so brilliantly disputed the axiom of casual necessity was only half done he clearly showed that it is impossible to prove the existence of necessary connection but it is also impossible to prove the contrary in the result everything remained as before kant and all mankind after him has returned to spinoza's position freedom has been driven into an intellectual world and unknown land from whose born no traveller returns and everything is in the former place philosophy wants to be a science at all costs it is absolutely impossible for her to succeed in this but the price she has paid for the right to be called a science is not returned to her she has waived the right of seeking that which she needed wherever she would and she is deprived of the right for ever but did she really need it if you glance at contemporary german philosophy you will say without hesitation that it was not needed at all neither by mistake nor even in pursuit of a new title did she renounce her great vocation it has become an intolerable burden to her however hard it may be to confess it is nevertheless indubitable that the great secrets of the universe cannot be manifested with the clarity and distinctness with which the visible and tangible world is open to us not only others 
you will not even convince yourself of your truth with the obviousness with which you can convince all men without exception of scientific truths revelations if they do occur are always revelations of an instant mohammed dostoevsky explains could only stay in paradise a very short time from half a second to five seconds even if he exceeded in falling into it and dostoevsky himself entered paradise only for an instant and here on earth both of them lived for years for tens of years and there seemed to be no end to the hell of earthly existence the hell was obvious demonstrable and it could be fixed exhibited ed oculus but how could paradise be proven how could one fix how express those half seconds of paradisic beatitude which were from the outside manifested in ugly and horrible epileptic fits with convulsions paroxysms a foaming mouth and sometimes an ill-omened sudden fall with the spilling of blood again believe if you will if you won't don't surely a man who lives now in paradise now in hell sees life utterly differently from others and he wants to think that he is right that his experience is of great value that life is not at all as it is described by men of different experience and more limited emotions how desperately did dostoevsky desire to persuade all men of his righteousness how stubbornly he used to demonstrate and how angry he was made by the consciousness that lived in the depths of his soul that he was impotent to prove anything but a fact remains a fact perhaps epileptics and madmen know things of which normal men have not even the remotest presentiment but it is not vouchsafed to them to communicate their knowledge to others or to prove it and there is a universal knowledge which is the very object of philosophical seeking with which one may commune but which by its very essence cannot be communicated to all that is cannot be turned into verified and demonstrable universal truths to renounce this knowledge in order that philosophy should have the right to be called a science at times men acted thus there were sober epochs when the pursuit of positive knowledge absorbed every one capable of intellectual labor or perhaps there were epochs in which men who sought something other than positive science were condemned to universal contempt and passed unregarded in such an epoch plato would have found no sympathy but would have died in obscurity one thing at least is clear he whose chief interest and motive in life is in undemonstrable truths is doomed to complete or relative sterility in the sense in which the world is generally understood if he is clever and gifted men may perhaps be interested in his mind and talent but they will pass his work with indifference contempt and even horror and they will begin to warn the world against him look to him my children he is stern and pale and lean he is poor and naked and all men count him mean has not the work of the prophets who sought for ultimate truths been barren and useless did life hold them in any account life went its own way and the voices of the prophets have been are and ever will be voices in the wilderness for that which they see and know cannot be proved and is not capable of proof prophets have always been isolated dissevered separate helpless men locked up in their pride prophets are kings without an army for all their love to their subjects they can do nothing for them for subjects respect only those kings who possess a formidable military power and long may it be so the limits of reality 
after all not even the most consistent and convinced realist represents life to himself as it really is he overlooks a great deal and on the other hand he often sees something which has no existence in reality i do not think there is any need to show this by example for all our desire to be objective we are after all extremely subjective and those things which kant calls synthetic judgments a priori by which our mind forms nature and dictates laws to her do play a great and serious part in our lives we create something like the veil of maya we are awake in sleep and sleep in wakefulness exactly as though some magical power had charmed us and just as in sleep we feel for instance that what is happening to us is like a half dream an intermediate half-life schopenhauer and the buddhists were right in asserting that it is equally wrong to say of the veil of maya the world accessible to us either that it exists or does not exist it is true that logic does not admit such judgments and persecutes them most implacably for they violate its most fundamental laws but it cannot be helped when one has to choose between philosophy which is alluring and promising and empty logic one will always sacrifice the latter for the former and philosophy without contradictory judgments would be either doomed to eternal silence or would be churned into a mud of commonplace and reduced to nothing philosophers know that the same is true of our own case we must confess that we are at the same time awake and dreaming dreams and at times we must own that though we are alive yet we have long since been dead as living beings we still hold to the accepted synthetic judgments a priori and as dead we try to do without them and to replace them by other judgments which have nothing in common with the former but are even opposite to them philosophy is occupied in this work with extreme diligence and in this and this alone is the meaning of the idealistic movement which has never since the time of plato disappeared from history the problem is not for us to find another primordial better and eternal world to replace the visible world accessible to all as idealistic philosophy is usually interpreted by her official and unfortunately her most influential representatives interpretation of that kind too obviously bears the mark of its empiric utilitarian origin they bring us as near to super empiric reality as do the notions wherewith we define what is valuable in life we might as well consider the super empiric world as one of gold diamond or pearls simply because gold diamonds and pearls are very costly but so it usually happens god himself is usually presented as glimmering with gold and precious stones as omniscient and omnipotent he is called the king of kings since on earth the lot of a crowned head is considered most enviable the meaning and value of idealistic philosophy thus appears to be that she forever ratifies all that we have found valuable on earth during our brief existence herein i believe is a fatal error idealistic philosophy it is true gave an excuse for falsely interpreting her since she loved to be arrayed in sumptuous apparel the religion of almost all nations has always sought for forms outwardly beautiful without stopping even before such an obvious paradox not to put it more strongly as a golden cross studded with diamonds and for the sake of sumptuous words and golden crosses men overlook great truths and perhaps great possibilities the philosophy of the schools also loved to array herself so that she should not be behind the masters in this respect and for the sake of dress she often forgot her necessary work 
plato taught that our life was only a shadow of another reality if this is true and he discovered the truth then surely our first task is to begin to live a different life to turn our back to the wall above which the shadows are walking and to turn our face to the source of light which created the shadows or to those things of which the visible outlines give only a remote resemblance we must be awakened if only in part to this end what is usually done to a person sound asleep must be done to us he is pulled pinched beaten tickled and if all these things fail still stronger and more heroic measures must be applied at all events it is out of the question to advise contemplation which may well make one still sleepier or quietude which leads to the same result philosophy should live by sarcasm irony alarm struggles despairs and allow herself contemplation and quietude only from time to time as a relaxation then perhaps she will succeed in creating by the side of realistic dreams dreams of a quite different order and visibly demonstrate that the universally accepted dreams are not the only ones what is the use i do not think this question need be answered he who asks it shows by the fact that he needs neither an answer nor philosophy while he who needs them will not ask but will patiently await events a temperature of one hundred and twenty degrees an epileptic fit or something of this kind which facilitates the difficult task of seeking the given and the possible the law of causation as a principle of inquiry is an excellent thing the existing sciences afford us convincing evidence of that but an idea in the platonic sense is of little value at times at least the strict harmony and order of the world have fascinated many people such giants of thought as spinoza and goethe paused with reverent wonder in contemplation of the great and unchangeable order of nature therefore they exalted necessity even to the rank of a primordial eternal original principle and we must confess that goethe's and spinoza's conception of the world lives so much in each one of us that in most cases we can love and respect the world only when our souls feel in it a symmetrical harmony harmony seems to us at once the highest value and the ultimate truth it gives to the soul great place a stable firmness a trust in the creator the highest boons accessible to mortal men as the philosophers teach nevertheless there are other yearnings man's heart is suddenly possessed by a longing for the fantastic the unforeseen for that which cannot be foreseen the beautiful world loves its beauty peace of soul seems disgraceful stability is felt as an intolerable burden just as youth grown to manhood suddenly feels irritated by the bountiful tutelage of his parents from which he has received so much though he does not even know what to do with his freedom so is a man of insight ashamed of the happiness which is given to him which someone has created the law of causation like the whole harmony of the world seems to him a pleasant gift facilitating life but yet a degrading one he has sold his birthright for peace for undisturbed happiness his great birthright a free creation he does not understand how a giant like goethe could have been seduced by the temptation of a pleasant life he suspects the sincerity of spinoza there is something rotten in the state of denmark the apple of the tree of knowledge of good and evil has become to him the sole purpose of life even though the path to it should lie through extreme suffering and strangely nature herself seems to be preoccupied in urging man to that fatal path 
there comes a time in our life when some imperative and secret voice forbids us to rejoice at the beauty and grandeur of the world the world allures us as before but it no longer gives pure happiness remember chekhov how he loved nature what immeasurable yearning is audible in his wonderful descriptions of nature just as though each time that he glanced at the blue sky the troubled sea or the green woods a voice of authority whispered to him all this is yours no longer you may look at it but you have no right to rejoice prepare yourself for another life where nothing will be given complete prepared where nothing will be created where there will be illimitable creation alone and everything which is in this world shall be given to destruction to destruction and destruction even this nature which you so passionately love which it is hard and painful for you to renounce everything drives us to the mysterious realm of the eternally fantastic eternally chaotic and who knows it may be the eternally beautiful end of section twelve section thirteen of anton chekhov and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org anton chekhov and other essays by lev shestov translated by john middleton murray and samuel kotelyansky section thirteen the theory of knowledge part three experiment and proof etc when cogito ergo sum came into descartes head he marked the day november tenth sixteen nineteen as a remarkable day the light of a wonderful discovery he wrote in his diary flashed into my mind schelling relates the same thing of himself in the year eighteen hundred and one he saw the light and to nietzsche when he roamed the mountains and the valleys of the engadine there came a mighty change he grasped the doctrine of eternal recurrence one might name many philosophers poets artists preachers who like these three suddenly saw the light and considered their vision the beginning of a new life it is even probable that all men who have been destined to display to the world something perfectly new and original have without exception experienced that miracle of sudden metamorphosis nevertheless though much is spoken of these miracles and often in nearly all biographies of great men we cannot strictly make any use of them descartes schelling nietzsche tell the story of their conversion and with us tolstoy and dostoevsky tell of theirs in the less remote past there are mohammed and paul the apostle in far antiquity the legend of moses but if i had chosen tenfold the number if thousands even had been collected it would still be impossible for the mind to make any deductions from them in other words all these cases have no value as scientific material or as one fossil skeleton or a unique case of an unknown rare disease is a precious windfall to the scientist what is still more interesting descartes was so struck by his cogito ergo sum nietzsche with his eternal recurrence mohammed with his paradise paul the apostle with his vision while we remain more or less indifferent to anything they may relate of their experiences only the most sensitive among us have an ear for stories of that kind and even they are obliged to hide their impressions within them for what can be done with them it is even impossible to fix them as indubitable facts for facts also require a verification and must be proved there are no proofs philosophic and religious teachings offered by men who have had extraordinary inward experiences not only do not generally confirm but rather refute their own stories of revelation 
for philosophic and religious teaching have always hitherto assigned themselves the task of attracting all and sundry to themselves and in order to attain this end they had to have recourse to such methods as have effect with the ordinary man who knows of nothing extraordinary to proof to the authority of visible and tangible phenomena which can be measured weighed and counted in their pursuit of proofs of persuasiveness and popularity they had to sacrifice the important and essential and expose for show that which is agreeable to reason things already more or less known and therefore of little interest and importance in course of time as experimental science so called gained more and more power the habit of hiding in oneself all that cannot be demonstrated ad oculus has become more and more firmly rooted until it is almost man's second nature nowadays we naturally share but a small part of an experience with our friends so that if mohammed and paul lived in our time it would not enter their heads to tell their extraordinary stories and for all his bravery nietzsche nevertheless passes quickly over eternal recurrence and is much more occupied with preaching the morality of the superman which though it at first astounded people was after all accepted with more or less modification because it was demonstrable evidently we are confronted with a great dilemma if we continue to cultivate modern methodology we run the risk of becoming so accustomed to it that we will lose not only the faculty of sharing all undemonstrable and exceptional experiences with others but even to retaining them firmly in the memory they will begin to be forgotten as dreams they will even seem to be waking dreams thus we will cut ourselves off for ever from a vast realm of reality whose meaning and value have by no means been divined or appreciated in olden times men could add dreams and madmen's visions to reality but we shall curtail the real indubitable reality transferring it to the realm of hallucinations and dreams i suppose even a modern man will feel some hesitation in coming over to the side of this methodology even though he is incapable of thinking with the ancients that dreams are by no means worthless things and if this is so then the rights of experiences must not be defined by the degree of their demonstrability however capricious our experiences may be however little they agree with the rooted and predominant conceptions of the necessary character of events in the inward and outward life once they have taken place in the soul of man they acquire ipso facto the lawful right of figuring side by side with facts which are most demonstrable and susceptible of control and verification and even with a deliberate experiment it may be said that we would not then be protected against deliberate frauds people who have never been in paradise will give themselves out for mohammed that is true they will talk and they will lie there will be no method of objective verification but they will surely tell the truth also for the sake of that truth we may make up our minds to swim through a whole ocean of lies yes it is not in the least impossible to distinguish truth from lie in this realm though certainly not by the signs which have been evolved by logic and not even by signs but by no signs at all the signs of the beautiful have not yet been even approximately defined and please god be it said without offence to the germans they never will be defined but yet we distinguish between apollo and venus so it is with truth she too may be recognized but what if a man cannot distinguish without signs and moreover does not want to what is to be done with him really i do not know besides i do not imagine that all men down to the last should act in unison 
when did all men act in agreement men have mostly acted separately meeting in certain places and parting in others long may it be so some will recognize and seek after truth by signs others without signs as they please and yet others in both ways the seventh day of creation socrates said he often used to hear from poets thoughts remarkable for their profundity and seriousness but when he began to inquire of them more particularly he became convinced that they themselves did not understand what they were saying what did he really mean did socrates wish to compare the poets to parrots or trained blackbirds who can learn by heart with the assistance of a man to teach them any ideas whatever perfectly foreign to them that can hardly be socrates hardly thought that what the poets say had been overheard by them from someone and mechanically fixed in their mind though it remained quite foreign to their soul most probably he used the word understand in the sense that they could not demonstrate or explain the soundness and stability of their ideas they could not deduce them and relate them to a definite conception of the world as every one knows socrates thought that not merely poets but all men from eminent statesmen down to ignorant artisans had ideas even a great many ideas but they never could explain where they had got them or make them agree among themselves in this respect poets were the same as the rest of people from some mysterious source they had acquired truths often great and profound but they were unable to explain them this seemed to socrates a great misery a real misfortune i do not know how it happened not a single historian of philosophy has explained it and indeed very little interest has been taken in it but socrates for some reason decided that an unproven and unexplained truth had less value than a proven and explained one in our times when a whole theory even a conception of the world has been made of socrates's idea this notion seems so natural and self-evident that no one doubts it but in antiquity the case was different strictly socrates thought that the poets had acquired their truths which they were unable to prove from a very respectable source which deserved all possible confidence he himself compared the poets with oracles and consequently admitted that they had communion with the gods there was therefore a most excellent guarantee that the poets were possessed of real undiluted truth the pledge of its purity being the divine authority socrates said that he himself had frequently been guided in his actions not by considerations of reason but by the voice of his mysterious demon that is at times he abstained from certain actions his demon gave him never positive but only negative advice without being able to produce reasons simply because the secret voice more authoritative than any human mind demanded abstinence from them is it not strange that under such circumstances at an epoch when the gods vouchsafed truths to men there should have suddenly appeared in a man the unexplained desire to acquire truths without the help of the gods and in independence of them by the dialectic method so beloved by the greeks it is doubtful which is more important for us to acquire the truth or to acquire for oneself with one's own effort it may be a false but one's own judgment the example of socrates who has been a pattern for all subsequent generations of thinking men leaves not the slightest doubt men do not need a truth ready-made they turn away from the gods to devote themselves to independent creations practically the same story is told in the bible what indeed was lacking to adam he lived in paradise in direct proximity to god from whom he could learn anything he wanted and yet it did not suit him 
it was enough that the serpent should make his perfidious proposal for the man to forget the wrath of god and all the dangers which threatened him and to pluck the apple from the forbidden tree then the truth which until the creation of the world and man had been one split and broke with a great perhaps an infinitely great number of most diverse truths eternally being born and eternally dying this was the seventh day of creation unrecorded in history man became god's collaborator he himself became a creator socrates renounced the divine truth and even spoke contemptuously of it merely because it was not proven that is because it does not bear the marks of man's handiwork socrates really did not prove anything but he was proving creating and in this he saw the meaning of his own life and of all human lives thus surely the pronouncement of the delphic oracle seems true even now socrates was the wisest of men and he who would be wise must imitating socrates not be like him in anything thus did all great men and all great philosophers what does the history of philosophy teach us neocontism is the prevalent school of modern philosophy the literature about kant has grown to unheard of proportions but if you attempt to analyze the colossal mass that has been written upon kant and put the question to yourself what has really been left to us of kant's teaching then to your great amazement you will have to reply nothing at all there is an extraordinary incredibly famous name kant and there is positively not a single kantian thesis which in an uninterpreted form would have survived till our day i say in an uninterpreted form for interpretations resolve at bottom into arbitrary recastings which often have not even an outward resemblance to the original these interpretations began while kant was still alive fichte gave the first example it is well known that kant reacted demanding that his teaching should be understood not in the spirit but in the letter and kant was naturally quite right of two things one either you take his teaching as it is or you invent your own but the fate of all thinkers who have been destined to give their names to an epoch is similar they have been interpreted recast till they are unrecognizable for after a short time had elapsed it became clear that their ideas were so overburdened with contradictions that in the form in which they emerged from the hands of their creators they are absolutely unacceptable indeed all the critics who have not made up their minds beforehand to be orthodox kantians came to the conclusion that kant had not proved a single one of his fundamental propositions something stronger may be said by virtue of the fact that kant owing to the central position which he occupied attracted much attention to himself and was forced to submit to very careful criticism there gradually emerged a truth which might have been known beforehand that kant's teaching is a mass of contradictions the sum total of more than a century's study of kant may be resumed in a few words although he was not afraid of the most crying contradictions he did not have the smallest degree of success in proving the correctness of his teaching with an extraordinary power and depth of mind with all the originality boldness and talent of his constructions he really provided nothing that might be indisputably called a positive acquisition of philosophy i repeat that i am not expressing my own opinion i am only reckoning the sum total of the opinions of the german critics of kant of those same critics who built him a monument Ari perineus the same may be said of all the great representatives of philosophic thought beginning with plato and aristotle 
and ending with hegel schopenhauer and nietzsche their works astonished by their power depth boldness beauty and originality of thought while you read them it seems that truth herself speaks with their lips and what strong measures of precaution did they take to prevent themselves from being mistaken they believed in nothing that men had grown accustomed to believe they methodically doubted everything re-examined everything tens hundreds of times they gave their life to the truth not in words but in deed and still the sum total is the same in their case as in kant's not one of them succeeded in inventing a system free from internal contradictions aristotle was already criticizing plato and the skeptics criticized both of them and so on until in our day each new thinker struggles with his predecessors refutes their contradictions and errors although he knows that he is doomed to the same fate the historians of philosophy are at infinite pains to conceal the most glaring and noticeable traits of philosophic creation which is at bottom no secret to any one the uninitiated and people generally who do not like thinking and therefore wish to be contemptuous of philosophy point to the lack of unity among philosophers as evidence that it is not worth while to study philosophy but they are both wrong the history of philosophy not only does not inspire us with the thought of the continual evolution of an idea but palpably convinces us of the contrary that among philosophers there is not has not been and will never be any aspiration towards unity neither will they find in future a truth free from contradictions for they do not seek the truth in the sense in which the word is understood by the people and by science and after all contradictions do not frighten them but rather attract schopenhauer begins his criticism of kant's philosophy with the words of voltaire it is the privilege of genius to make great mistakes with impunity i believe that the secret of the philosophic genius lies here he makes great the greatest mistakes and with impunity moreover his mistakes are put to his credit for the important matter is not his truths or his judgment but himself when you hear from plato that the life we see is only a shadow when spinoza intoxicated by god exalts the idea of necessity when kant declares that reason dictates laws to nature listening to them you do not examine whether their assertions are true or not you agree with each of them whatever he says and only this question arises in your soul who is he that speaketh as one having authority later on you will reject all their truths with horror perhaps with indignation and disgust even with utter indifference you will not consent to accept that our life is only a shadow of actual reality you will revolt against spinoza's god who cannot love yet demands love for himself kant's categorical imperative will seem to you a cold monster but you will never forget plato or spinoza or kant and will forever keep your gratitude to them who made you believe that authority is given to mortals then you will understand that there are no errors and no truths in philosophy that errors and truth are only for him above whom is set a superior authority a law a standard but philosophers themselves create laws and standards this is what we are taught by the history of philosophy this is what is most difficult for man to master and understand i have already said that the historians of philosophy draw quite a different moral from the study of the great human creations end of section thirteen section fourteen of anton chekhov and other essays this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anton Chekhov and Other Essays by Lev Shestov Translated by John Middleton Murray and Samuel Kotelyansky Section 14 The Theory of Knowledge Part 4 Science and Metaphysics Etc. In his autobiography, Spencer confesses that he had really never read Kant. He had had the critique of pure reason in his hands and had even read the beginning the transcendental ascetic but the beginning convinced him it was no use for him to read further once a man had made the unconvincing admission which kant had made by accepting the subjectivity of one form of perception of space and time he could not be taken seriously into account if he is consistent all his philosophy will be a system of absurdity and nonsense if he is inconsistent the less attention does he deserve spencer confidently asserts that once he could not accept kant's fundamental proposition he not only could not be a kantian any more but he found it useless even to become further acquainted with kant's philosophy that he did not become a kantian is nothing to grieve over there are kantians enough without him but that he did not acquaint himself with kant's principal works and above all with the whole school that rose out of kant may be sincerely regretted perhaps as a new man remote from continental traditions he would have made a curious discovery and would have convinced himself that it was not at all necessary to accept the proposition of the subjectivity of space and time in order to become a kantian and perhaps with the frankness and simplicity peculiar to him which is not afraid to be taken for naivete he would have told us that not a single kantian schopenhauer excepted not even kant himself had ever seriously accepted the fundamental propositions of the transcendental ascetic and therefore has never made from them any conclusions or deductions whatever on the contrary the transcendental ascetic was itself a deduction from another proposition that we have synthetic judgments a priori the original role of this the most original of all theories ever invented was to be a support and an explanation of the mathematical sciences it had never been an independent material content susceptible of analysis and investigation space and time are the eternal forms of our perception of the world to this according to the strict meaning of kant's teaching nothing can be added and nothing abated spencer not having read the book to the end imagined that kant would begin to make deductions and became nervous but if he had read the book to the end he would have been convinced that kant had not made any deductions and that the whole meaning of the critique of pure reason indeed is that from the propositions of the transcendental ascetic no deductions can be made it is now about a hundred and fifty years since the critique of pure reason appeared no philosophic work has been so much studied and criticized and yet where are the kantians who attempt to make deductions from the propositions as to the subjectivity of space and time schopenhauer is the only exception he indeed took the kantian idea seriously but it may be said without exaggeration that of all kantians the least like kant was schopenhauer the world is a veil of maya would kant really have agreed to such an interpretation of his transcendental ascetic or what would kant have said if he had heard that schopenhauer referring to the same ascetic in which he saw the greatest philosophic revelation had admitted the possibility of clairvoyance and magic probably spencer thought that kant would himself make all these deductions and therefore threw away the book which bound him to conclusions so absurd it is a pity that spencer was in such a hurry had he acquainted himself with kant he would have been convinced that the most absurd idea might serve a very useful purpose and that there is not the least necessity to make from an idea all the deductions to which it may lead 
a man is a free agent and he can deduce if he has a mind to if he has not he will not and there is no necessity to judge the character of a philosophic theory by its general postulates even schopenhauer did not exploit kant's theory to the full which if it had really divined the truth hitherto hidden from man would have not only put an end to metaphysical researches but also have given an impulse and a justification to perfectly new experiments from which the previous standpoint were quite mad and unimaginable for if space and time are forms of our human perception then they do indeed hide the ultimate truth from us while men knew nothing of this and simple-minded accepted the visible reality for the actual real they could not of course dream of true knowledge but from the moment when the truth was revealed to them through kant's penetration it is clear that their true task was to use every possible means to free themselves from the harness and to break away from it while consolidating all those judgments which kant calls synthetic judgments a priori for all eternity and the new the critical metaphysics which should take account of the stupid situation in which these had hitherto found themselves who saw in apodictic judgments eternal truths and a great task to set herself to get rid at all costs of apodictic judgments knowing them for false in other words kant's task should not have been to minimize the destructive effect of hume's skepticism but to find a still more deadly explosive to destroy even those limits which hume was obliged to preserve it is surely evident that truth lies beyond synthetic judgments a priori and that it cannot at all resemble an a priori judgment and in fact cannot be like a judgment of any kind and it must be sought by methods quite different from those by which it has been sought hitherto to some extent kant attempted to describe how he represented to himself the meaning hidden beneath the words space and time are subjective forms of perception he even gave an object lesson saying that perhaps there are beings who perceive the world otherwise than under the forms of space and time which means that for such beings there is no change all that we perceive by a succession of changes they perceive at once to them julius caesar is still alive though he is dead to them the twenty-fifth century a d which none of us will live to see and the twenty-fifth century b c which we reconstruct with some difficulty from the fragmentary traces of the past which have accidentally been preserved to us the remote north pole and even the stars which we cannot see through the telescope all are as accessible to them as to us the events which are taking place before our eyes nevertheless kant in spite of all temptation to acquire the knowledge to which such beings have access notwithstanding his profound conviction of the truth of his discovery did nothing to dispel the charm of forms of perception and categories of the reason or to tear the blinkers from his eyes and see all the depth of the mysterious reality hitherto hidden from us he does not even give a little circumstantial explanation why he considered such a task impracticable and he confines himself to the dogmatic assertion that man cannot conceive a reality beyond space and time why it is a question of immense importance compared with it all the problems of the critique of pure reason are secondary how is mathematics possible how are natural sciences possible these are not even questions at all compared to the question whether it is possible to free ourselves from conventional human knowledge in order to attain the ultimate all-embracing truth herein the kantians display an even greater indifference than kant himself they are even proud of their indifference they plume themselves upon it as a high virtue 
they assert that truth is not beyond synthetic judgments a priori but indeed in them and that it is not the creator who put blinkers upon us but we ourselves devised them and that any attempt to remove them and look open-eyed upon the world is evidence of perversity if the old serpent appeared nowadays to seduce the modern adam he would retire discomfited even eve herself would be no use to him the twentieth century eve studies in a university and has quite sufficiently blunted her natural curiosity she can talk excellently well of the teleological point of view and is quite as proof as man against temptation i do not share kant's confidence that space and time are forms of our perception nor do i see a revelation in it but if i had once accepted his apocalyptic assertion and could think that there was some truth in it i would not depart from it to positive science it is a pity that spencer did not read the critique of pure reason to the end he would have convinced himself of an important truth that a philosopher has no need to take into consideration all the deductions from his premises he need only have good will and he can draw from the most paradoxical and suspicious premises conclusions which are fully conformable to common sense and the rules of decency and since kant's will was as good as spencer's they would have agreed perfectly in their deductions though they were so far apart from each other in their premises a tacit assumption schopenhauer was the first philosopher to ask the value of life and he gave a definite answer in life there is much more suffering than joy therefore life must be renounced i must add that strictly speaking he asked not only the value of life but also the value of joy and suffering and to this question he gave an equally definitive answer according to his teaching joy is always negative suffering always positive therefore by its essence joy cannot compensate for suffering in all this philosophical construction both in formulating and answering the questions there is one tacit particularly curious and interesting and unexpressed postulate schopenhauer starts from the assumption that his valuation of life joy and suffering in order to have the right to be called truth must contain something universal by virtue of which it will in the last resort coincide with the valuation of all other people whence did he derive this idea psychologically the train of schopenhauer's thought is intelligible and easily explained he was used to the scientific formulation and solution of problems and he transferred to the question which engaged him methods of investigation which by general consent usually conduct us to the truth he did not verify his premises ad hoc and usually it is impossible to verify a premises every time that a need arises for it it is not even becoming to exhibit it to speak of it it is understood if the fundamental sign of any truth is its being universal and obligatory then in the given case the true answer to the question of the value of life can only be something which will be absolutely admissible by all men to all creatures with a mind so schopenhauer would probably have answered if any one had questioned his right to formulate in such a general way the question of the value of life still schopenhauer would hardly be right this by the way is being made clear by the objections which are put forward by his opponents he is accused because his very statements of the question presupposes a subjective point of view eudemonism the question of the value of life people object is not at all decided by whether in the sum life gives more joy than pain or vice versa life may be deeply painful and devoid of joy life may in itself be one compact horror and still be valuable 
schopenhauer's philosophy was not discussed in his lifetime so that he could not answer his opponents but if he were still alive would he accept these objections and renounce his pessimism i am convinced that he would not at the same time i am convinced that his opponents would be no less firm and would go on repeating the question is not one of happiness or suffering we value life by a quite different and independent standard in the discussion it would perhaps become clear to the disputants that the premise mentioned above which both accepted as requiring no proof and understood without explanation does indeed require proofs and explanations but is provided with neither to one man the eudemonistic point of view is ultimate and decisive to another contemptible and degrading and he seeks the meaning of life in a higher ethical or ascetic purpose there are also people who love sorrow and pain and see in them the justification and the source of the depth and importance of life nor do i mention the fact that when the sum totals of life are reckoned different accounts reach different and directly contradictory results or that insoluble questions arise concerning these or other details schopenhauer for instance finds as we have seen that sufferings are positive joys negative and hence he concludes that it is not worth while to submit to the least unpleasantness for the sake of the greatest joy what answer can be made how can he be convinced of the contrary nevertheless the fact is obvious many people regard the matter in quite a different light for the sake of a single happiness they are ready to endure a great many serious hardships in a word schopenhauer's premise is quite unjustified and not only cannot be accepted as an indubitable fact but must be qualified as an indubitable error it is impossible to be certain beforehand that to the question of the value of life a single universally valid answer can be given so here we meet with an extraordinarily curious case from the point of view of the theory of knowledge it appears that by the very essence of the matter no uniform answer can be given to one of the most important questions perhaps the most important question of philosophy if you are asked what is life good or evil you are obliged to say that life is both good and evil or something independent of good and evil or a mixture of good and evil in which there is more good than evil or more evil than good and i repeat each of these answers though they logically quite exclude each other has the right to claim the title of truth for if it has not power enough to make the other answers bow down before it at all events it has the necessary strength to repel its opponent's attacks and defend its sovereign rights instead of a sole and omnipotent truth before which the weak and helpless errors tremble you have before you a whole line of perfectly independent truths excellently armed and defended instead of absolutism you have a feudal system and the vassals are so firmly ensconced in their castles that an experienced eye can see at once that they are impregnable i took for my instance schopenhauer's doctrine of the value of life but many philosophic doctrines although they issue from the premise of one sovereign truth display examples of the plurality of truths it is usually believed that one should study the history of philosophy in order to be palpably convinced that mankind has gradually mastered its delusions and is now on the high road to ultimate truth my opinion is that the history of philosophy must bring every impartial person who is not infected by modern prejudices to a directly opposite conclusion there can be no doubt that a whole series of questions exists like that of the value of life by which their very essence do not admit of the uniform solution 
to this testimony is often borne by men whose very last concern is to curtail the royal prerogative of sovereign truth natorp confidently asserts that aristotle not only did not understand but could not understand plato der Tithere grund ist die ewige unfagistkeit des dogmatismus sich in der geistigpunkt der christen philosophie überhaupt zu versitzen eternal incapability what words and used not of any commonplace person but of the greatest human genius known to us of aristotle had natorp been a little more inquisitive eternal incapability of that kind should have worried him at least as much as plato's philosophy on which he wrote a large book for here is evidently a great riddle different people according to the different constitution of their souls are while yet in their mother's womb destined to have different philosophies it reminds me of the famous calvinistic view of, of predetermination just as from before birth god has destined some to damnation others to salvation so to some it is given and from others withheld to know the truth and not that torp alone argues this it would be true to say all modern philosophers who are always contending with each other and suspecting each other of eternal incapability philosophers have not the same means of compelling conviction as the representatives of other positive sciences they cannot force every one to undeniable conclusions their ultima ratio their personal opinion their private conviction their last refuge is the eternal incapability of their opponents to understand them here the tragic dilemma is clear to all of two things one either renounce philosophy entirely or allow that that which natorp calls the eternal incapability is not a vice or a weakness but a great virtue and power hitherto unappreciated and misunderstood aristotle indeed was organically incapable of understanding plato just as plato could not have understood aristotle just as neither of them could understand the sceptics or the sophists just as leibniz could not understand spinoza as schopenhauer could not understand hegel and so on till our riotous modern days when no philosopher can understand any one except himself besides philosophers do not aspire to mutual understanding and unity but usually it is with the utmost reluctance that they observe in themselves similarity to their predecessors when the similarity of schopenhauer's teaching to that of spinoza was pointed out to him he said pariant qui ante nos nostra dixirent but representatives of the other positive sciences understand each other rarely dispute and never argue by referring to the eternal incapability of their confreres perhaps in philosophy this chaotic state of affairs and this unique argument are part of the craft perhaps in this realm it is necessary that aristotle should not understand plato and should not accept him that the materialists should always be at war with the idealists the sceptics with the dogmatists in other words the premise with which schopenhauer began the investigation into the value of life and which as we have shown he took without verification from the representatives of positive science though perfectly applicable in its proper sphere is quite out of place in philosophy and indeed though they never speak of it philosophers value their own personal convictions much more highly than universally valid truth the impossibility of discovering one sole philosophic truth may alarm any one but the philosophers themselves who so soon as they have worked out their own convictions take not the smallest trouble to secure general recognition for them they are only busy with getting rid of their vassal dependence and acquiring sovereign rights for themselves the question whether there will be other sovereigns by their side hardly concerns them at all 
the history of philosophy should be so expounded that the tendency should be clearly manifest this would spare us from many prejudices and would clear the way for new and important inquiries kant who shared the opinion that truth is the same for all was convinced that metaphysics must be a science a priori and since it cannot be a science a priori must therefore cease to exist if the history of philosophy had been expounded and understood differently in his day it would never have entered his mind thus to impugn the rights of metaphysics and probably he would not have been vexed by the contradictoriness or the lack of proof in the teachings of various schools of metaphysics it cannot be otherwise neither should it be the interest of mankind is not to put an end to the variety of philosophic doctrines but to allow the perfectly natural phenomenon wide and deep development philosophers have always had an instinctive longing for this that is why they are so troublesome to the history of philosophy end of section fourteen section fifteen of anton chekhov and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org anton chekhov and other essays by lev shestov translated by john middleton murray and samuel kotelyansky the theory of knowledge part v the first and the last in the first volume of human all too human which nietzsche wrote at the very beginning of his disease when he was still far from final victory and chiefly told of his defeats there is the following remarkable though half involuntary confession the complete irresponsibility of man for his actions and his being is the bitterest drop for the man of knowledge to drink since he has been accustomed to see in responsibility and duty the very patent of his title to manhood much bitterness has the inquiring spirit to swallow but the bitterest of all is in the knowledge that his moral qualities his readiness to fulfill his duty ungrudgingly gives him no preference over other men he thought he was a man of noble rank even a prince of the blood crowned with a crown and the other men boorish peasantry but he is just the same a peasant the same as all the rest his patent of nobility was that for which he fulfilled his most arduous duty and made sacrifices in it he saw the meaning of life and when it is suddenly revealed that there is no provision made for titles or patents it is a horrible catastrophe a cataclysm and life loses all meaning evidently the conviction expressed with such moving frankness in these words was with nietzsche a second nature which he could not master all his life long what is the superman but a title a patent giving the right to be called a noble among the canielli what is the pathos of distance and all nietzsche's teaching of ranks the formula beyond good and evil was by no means so all destructive as at first sight it seemed on the contrary by erasing certain laws graven on the tablets of mankind of old that formula as it were revealed other commandments obliterated by time and therefore invisible to many all morality all good in and for itself is rejected but the patent of nobility grows more precious until it becomes if not the only value at least the chief life loses its meaning once titles and ranks are destroyed once he is deprived of the right to hold his head high to throw out his chest his belly even and to look with contempt upon those about him in order to show to what extent the doctrine of rank has become attached to the human soul i would recall the words of the gospel about the first and last 
Christ, who seemed to speak in a language utterly new, who taught men to despise earthly blessings, riches, fame, honors, who so easily yielded Caesar his due, because he thought that only Caesar would find it useful. Christ himself, when he spoke to men, did not think it possible to take from them their hope of distinction. The first shall be last. What? Will there be first and second there, too? Yes, so it stands in the gospel. Is it because there is indeed in the division of men into ranks something original and warrantable? Or is it because Christ who spoke to humankind could not but use human words? It may be that, but for that promise, and generally the series of promises of rewards accessible to the human understanding, the gospel would not have fulfilled its greatest historic mission. It would have passed unnoticed on the earth, and no one would have detected or recognized in it the evangel. Christ knew that men could renounce all things, save the right to superiority alone, to superiority over one's neighbors, to that which Nietzsche calls the patent of nobility. Without that superiority, men of a certain rank cannot live. They become what the Germans so appropriately called Vogelfrei, deprived of the protection of the laws, since the laws are the only source of their right. Rude, nonsensical, disgusting reality, against which, I repeat, their only defense is the patent of nobility. The unwritten charter approaches them closer and closer, with more and more menace and importunacy, and claims its right. If you are the same as all other men, it says, take your experience of life from me. Fulfill your trivial obligations. Worse than that, accept from me the fines and reprimands to which the rank and file are subject, even to corporeal punishment. How could he accept those degrading conditions who had been used to think he had the right to carry his head high, to be proud and independent? Nietzsche tries with dull submissiveness to swallow the horrible bitterness of his confession, but courage and endurance, even his courage and endurance, are not enough for this, his greatest and most terrible task. He cannot bear the horror of a life deprived of rights and defenses. He seeks again for power and authority, which would protect him and give him his lost rights again. He will not rest until he receives, under another name, a restitutio in integrum of all the rights which had previously been his. And surely not Nietzsche alone acted thus. The whole history of ethics, the whole history of philosophy is to no small degree the incessant search for prerogative and privilege, patents and charters. The Christians, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, did not in the least differ from the enemy of Christianity, Nietzsche, the humble Jew, Spinoza, and the meek pagan Socrates, the idealist Plato, and the idealist Aristotle, the founders of the newest, noblest, and loftiest systems, Kant, Fichte, Hegel, even Schopenhauer, the pessimist, all as one man seek a charter, a charter, a charter. Evidently, life on earth without a charter becomes for the best men a horrible nightmare and an intolerable torment. Even the founder of Christianity, who so easily renounced all privileges, considered it possible to preserve this privilege for his disciples and perhaps, who knows, for himself too. Whereas, if Nietzsche and those other philosophers had been able resolutely to renounce titles, ranks, and honors, which are distributed not only by morality, but by all the other Sanhedrim, real and imaginary, which are set over man, if they could have drunk this cup to the dregs, then they might have known, seen, and heard much that was suspected by none before them. Long since men have known that the road to knowledge lies by way of a great renunciation, neither righteousness nor genius gives a man privilege above others. He is deprived, 
forever deprived of the protection of earthly laws there are no laws today he is a king tomorrow a slave today god tomorrow a worm today first tomorrow last and the worm crushed by him today will be god his god tomorrow all the measures and balances by which men are distinguished one from another are defaced for ever and there is no certainty that the place a man once occupied will still be his and all philosophers have known this nietzsche too knew it and by experience he was a friend and ally and the collaborator of the great wagner the herald of a new era upon earth and later he grovelled in the dust broken and crushed and a second time this thing happened to him when he had finished zarathustra he became insane more exactly he became half idiot it is true he carried the secret of the second fall with him to the grave yet something has reached us for all his sister's efforts to conceal from carnal eyes the change that had befallen him and now we ask is the essence of life really in the rank the charter the patent of nobility and can the words of christ be understood in their literal sense are not all the sanhedrim set over man and as it were giving meaning to his life mere fictions useful and even necessary in certain moments of life but pernicious and dangerous to say no more when the circumstances are changed does not life the real and desirable life which men have sought for thousands of years begin there where there is neither first nor last righteous nor sinner genius or incapable is not the pursuit of recognition of superiority of patents and charters of rank that which prevents man from seeing life with its hidden miracles and must man really seek protection in the college of heralds or has he another power that time cannot destroy one may be a good able learned gifted man even a man of genius but to demand in return any privileges whatsoever is to betray goodness and ability and talent and genius and the greatest hopes of mankind the last on earth will nowhere be first end of section fifteen end of anton chekhov and other essays by lev shestov translated by john middleton murray and samuel kotelianski